When we look at the armor of God, we think of Roman soldier. We think of a physical soldier. But Paul tells us that we don't fight like this world. So why do we apply the Roman soldier to Ephesians 6 when Paul tells us that we fight not of this world or like this world? What ends up happening is we start, because we have a wrong understanding of the scripture, we start developing this unnecessary militancy and we're always having this mindset of fighting all the time when in reality it has nothing to do with the fight that you perceive it to be. Let, let, me, let me explain something. Look up the word kiss the word kiss it's the hebrew word and it means to fasten the lips like a kiss but it also means to arm with weaponry it's actually found in song of solomon chapter 2 where it says where the lover is talking to the bride groom and she says oh lord kiss me with the kisses of your mouth those who kiss the lord and the lord kisses them are armed with spiritual weaponry because the fight is not like this world the violence that speaks of the kingdom is a love of God. It's for lovers. The Bible says in the in the book of Revelation, in the last half, the body of Christ is addressed not as fighters, but as kings and priests to their God and a bride. The armor of God has nothing to do with the Roman soldier. When we think of the armor of God, we think of a Roman soldier with a helmet, with a bunch of like chainmail breastplate, with a big shield, with a big giant sword, sandals, and a big belt. The problem with that is that it cannot be talking about that. And here's why. Because Paul is actually quoting Isaiah 59. Let's go there. Look what it says here. Then the Lord saw it. This is verse 15, and he says this, and it displeased him that there was no justice. So the Lord is looking around and the Lord is being displeased because there was no justice. And then look at what verse 16 says. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm, which is the Messiah, which is Jesus, brought salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. This was written way before the Romans. So we're seeing some key words here. Verse 16, intercessor. We're seeing the word, therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. The Lord's arm. The word salvation is the Hebrew word Yeshua. This is speaking of Jesus and his own righteousness sustained him. And he put on righteousness as a breastplate. Does that sound familiar? That's in Ephesians chapter six. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Wow. Then he talks about having on the breastplate of righteousness. But it has to do with intercession. See, the weapons of our warfare are not like soldiers that fight. It's intercessors that are raised up to do warfare God's way. And a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments and vengeance for clothing and a clad zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, according he will repay. Now, what is this breastplate that is speaking of here? Well, the way that the breastplate was understood in the Old Testament was the breastplate that went upon the high priest that had the 12 stones of every tribe of Israel. And the high priest would put that breastplate on. It was considered the righteousness of God because that high priest would enter into the presence of God to make intercession for the people. That is the breastplate that is being referred to there. And the helmet of salvation is speaking of the miter of the high priest, that on the miter or the helmet of the high priest had the words inscribed holy to the Lord. It says there that it's a helmet of salvation and the word salvation is the Hebrew word Yeshua. It's the helmet of Christ. It is Jesus as our high priest. The armor in Ephesians is a direct relationship with Isaiah 59. And so those who fight are not fighters that have a sword and they're wielding things around. No, the sword is the word of the Lord, the breastplate and the helmet of salvation and all of the armaments are priestly garments. Why? Because the scripture says that he has made us a royal priesthood a holy nation, a kingdom of 
priests to our God, when you see yourself as not some soldier wielding a giant sword, but as a priest carrying the presence of God and going into making intercession, you will see that this is how you fight. I want you to see something else here. The priest in the Old Testament wasn't just someone that was locked up in the temple. The priest was actually part of the military of Israel, but they did not fight like the rest of the tribes of Israel at all. How did they fight? Second Chronicles chapter 20. Look at this. Here is the king of Israel. He says this. I'll just read the whole thing. There's a real problem. There's a real threat. The Moabites are encircling Jerusalem. And the king, Jehoshaphat, is terrified. And it says this. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. So here is Jehoshaphat and the Moabites are encircling Jerusalem and he has no idea what to do. And this army is too vast and it is too great for Jerusalem. So he says, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now all of Judah with their little ones and their wives and their children stood before the Lord. The word Judah, the tribe of Judah in 2 Chronicles 20 verse 13 is the tribe of praise. Now look at what happens. Judah, all of the tribes of Judah are there, and the wives and the children, those who are the most weakest, most dependent, stood before the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite, who's a priest, and the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. And he said, listen, all of Judah and all of inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be dismayed or afraid because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. Now notice something, the tribe of praise and the dependent little ones, the ones that there were most weak in society stood before the Lord when the priests began to prophesy. Now the activity of heaven and the strategies, my God, of heaven were released through the priest. Do you see that? So here's the king. He's terrified. And the priest is the one that's getting the download from heaven. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up from the accent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. You see, it has nothing to do with a carnal fight. He says, position yourselves and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Position yourselves. How do you position? You stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Salvation of the Lord is the Hebrew word Yeshua. It stands still and see Christ, my friend. Now watch this. This is the strategy of heaven. Because in Ephesians chapter 6, after mentioning the full armor of God, he says to the Ephesians two times, he says, stand, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your, your loins girded with truth, your breastplate of righteousness. Stand still. This is how we fight, understanding we are priests, intercessors. Watch this. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head. He understood that when the priest spoke, it was God speaking. Why? Because the priest was the intercessor, was the gap between heaven and man. And what are we? A kingdom of priests. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord. And what was the response? They worshiped. It says this, the response, they bowed his head to the ground, humility and the inhabitants, and they were worshiping. You see, this is how we fight our battle. Watch this. Then the Levites, verse 19, and the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. What is happening? The priests now, after hearing the divine response, they begin to stand up. The Levites, the children of the Kohathites, the children of the Korites, these are the priests. They stood up to do what? Fight? Wield their swords around? No. What did they do? Praise the Lord God of Israel with voices, what? Loud, loud and 
eye. This is how we fight. This is how we engage. And watch this. So they rose early in the morning. They went out to the wilderness of, of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood. He says, hear me, O Judah, the tribe of praise and the inhabitants of Jerusalem is the city of peace. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he, the king, appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should sing praise to what? The beauty of holiness. As they went out before the army and were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, when they began to sing praise, the Lord sent ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. How were they defeated? They were still. They began to praise the Lord. King Jehoshaphat had discernment and wisdom to understand that we're not fighting a regular battle here, so I'm going to take the priests and they're going to go before the armies and they're going to sing praises. And what are they going to do? They're going to praise the beauty of the Lord. Look, praise the beauty of his holiness. And as they went out before the army saying, praise the Lord, his mercy endures forever. And when they began to sing praises, the ambushes were now given from the presence of God and the enemy was destroyed. This is how you fight your battles. This is how we are to engage. We're not a bunch of Roman soldiers slinging little gladiuses around. We are a nation that is holy, devoted unto the Lord, a culture of priests. Do you see that? So the priests provoked the presence and the power of God was released to destroy the enemy. Those are types and shadows that are seen. Praise provokes God to move. This is how we fight. The Bible says that in the New Testament, everything that Israel went through was for our encouragement and our consolation and our understanding and learning. We constantly are struggling and fighting and seeing ourselves the wrong way. And we wonder why we're hitting walls constantly. That's not our position. Our position is a priestly one. 